Let's open our Bibles to the book of Jeremiah and pick up where we left off. Jeremiah chapter 16. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would just speak to us tonight. As we continue our study through the book of Jeremiah, may we find Jesus on every page. And in doing so, may we find ourselves as well, Lord. May we see ourselves in light of your glory. May we not compare ourselves with any man, but may we compare ourselves with you. Thus, we know, Lord, we'll have the right perspective. But we thank you, Lord, as we do compare ourselves with you. You're so gracious to remind us that we're still loved and accepted in your beloved. And we thank you for Jesus, who is our beloved. And we thank you in Jesus' name for his endless intercession for us. Even now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, chapter 16, verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, You remember last week we made mention of this phrase, And the word of the Lord came unto me. We're going to see it quite, a, quite often As Jeremiah is telling us, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, or the word of the Lord came to me. And notice he says, to me, not to the nation, not to anybody else. Jeremiah is about the only one that is listening now to the voice of God. And so he says, Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came. Now, how did God speak to Jeremiah? I mean, it had to be pretty clear. You know, it had to be pretty clear for Jeremiah to do the things that he did. You remember, Jeremiah was the kind of guy that that spoke a lot of times to the nation through pictures. Remember, God told him to go and buy the, the sash, put it around him, that brand new sash, and he walked around with this beautiful sash where everybody would say, wow, where'd you get that? Oh, wow, that's brand new, isn't it, Jeremiah? And he wore it but he never washed it. So week after week after week, they they begin to say, oh, that's that new set. Why don't you wash it? It's starting to smell, you know, or whatever, you know, and and they're just, they're they're looking at it, and then God says, now I want you to go to Babylon, and I want you to go to the river Euphrates, and I want you to bury it in the rocks. And I want you to bury it there. And then he came back, And then God says, after many days, he told him to go back and pick it up and get the same sash. I mean, you're talking 350 miles each way. And so he, on his way, coming back, on his way, coming back. And then he comes back when he gets, regains that sash. God says, now put it on. And he comes back and it's all dirty, filthy, and and bug-eaten and And everything, I mean, it's got little slugs and things, slimy things that crawl under and live under rocks and stuff on it. And it's just moist and stinky. And as he probably walked across that desert in the sun, it's probably even got even riper. And the thing is, you know, I mean, it just finally just got so bad that people were, oh, you know, and he had a message, didn't he? Well, God told Jeremiah to speak several times, to the nation through pictures, through living pictures. Remember, God did that with their Isaiah. You remember Isaiah? He walked around for, what, two and a half, three years naked in front of the people of Israel? Why? Because it was God's way of telling them, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be carried away as slaves into captivity. From the Assyrians and from the Babylonians, you're going to be carried away. And that because that's the way that you would be carried away into slavery. 
you would be stripped of your clothes and you'd walk naked into slavery. And so God had them do many things. Well, here in chapter 16, we have the same picture again, another picture that prophesied and told them that something's going to happen. And so the word of the Lord came also unto Jeremiah. As I said, the word of the Lord came to him. It had to be very clear to him. How did God speak to him? Well, we're going to see that later on. We're going to finally come to a chapter that kind of gives us a clue how Jeremiah heard the voice of the Lord, how the word of the Lord came to him and how he recognized it. And so we'll save that. And now I'm going to bring that and tease you guys for several more weeks before we get to that chapter. And then we'll see how it all comes to, comes to pass and how God spoke to Jeremiah and how he recognized the voice of God. And so he says, the voice, the Lord said to him in verse 2, Thou shalt not take a wife, neither shalt thou have sons and daughters in this place. Whoa, what a big request. I don't want you to marry. And I don't want you to have any children. Now this was something to ask a Jewish man not to do. I mean, by the time he, you were 16, 17, 18 years of age, you knew who your wife was going to be, and you usually was espoused to her. And by the time you were 20 or 21, you were married. Matter of fact, the rabbis said that if a man refused to be, remar- to be, ref- refused to be married, he was to be cursed. And matter of fact, you were looked upon very suspiciously if you weren't married by the time you were 21. Now, for you single guys, don't get upset if you're not married by the age of 21, especially my son who might be listening to this tape in another week or two. That, that it's, it's not that way in our society today, but in their society, they looked upon it very suspiciously if you weren't married, and if you didn't want to be married, a curse would be upon you. And God comes to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, I don't want you to be married. I don't want you to take a wife. Now, this wasn't an option. It wasn't a request. It was a command. And he says, don't take a wife and don't have any children. And matter of fact, he tells them to do several things here. And these are the prohibitions that, 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 that God lays upon Jeremiah while he's ministering to these people of Judah that are about ready to be carried away into Babylonian Babylonian captivity. And so he says, Thou shalt not take a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. For thus saith the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters who are born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bore them, and concerning their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths, they shall not be Lament neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as refuge upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine and by carcass, and their carcass shall be food for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. Basically, what God says is that the reason why I don't want you to be married is because you're going to use this as as a message that there is not going to be any marriages, there's not going to be any sons and daughters in the land of Israel. They're going to be killed. I mean, God says it very clearly, and we've been seeing it lately, is that God was going to allow the Babylonians to destroy his own people. And there weren't going to be anybody left. And he'll reiterate this as we go on through the chapters tonight. He's going to tell them, Total judgment is coming upon you, and there's no escape. Matter of fact, you won't have any burials. You won't have any marriages, and there won't be any children in the land because there is not going to have, there's not going to have anybody in the, in the city, in the, in, the, in the land. And so he goes on, and he says this. He says, For thus, thus saith the Lord in verse 5, Enter not into the house of mourning. Don't go to funeral parlors for him. Neither go to lament nor bemoan them, for I have taken away my peace from this people, saith the Lord, even loving kindness and mercy. Man, that's, 
That's heavy when God gets to that point where he says, I have taken my loving kindness, my tender mercies away. You know, I mean, both the great and the small shall die in this land and shall not be buried. Neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor, nor make themselves bald for them. Now, basically what God is going to tell them here in between verses 1 through 9 is that I don't want you to be married, and I don't want you to mourn for them, and I don't want you to feast. Now, when he talks about in feasting in just a couple of verses here, he talks about the feasting that is connected to both of those events. Funerals and weddings. Funerals, often, after the end of a funeral, what do people usually go back to their, the home of the, of the person that's lost the loved one or somebody that's close to them and they have uh, food there for the family and for the people that have gone to the funerals and then you sit there and you, you eat and you comfort one another. And then at a wedding, uh, definitely there's feasting. There's feasting before, you know, at the, at the, uh, at the, for the marriage uh, party and all that, the, the, maybe a day or two before the wedding. And then there's, there's the ceremony, and then there's the, the reception, and there's feasting. And, and he says, I don't want you to be connected to any of that. Because when judgment comes, there is not going to be any feasting there's only going to be mourning. And there's not going to be anybody there to mourn for. I mean, you won't be here. There won't be people here to mourn for, for others. Because whoever's left are going to be carried away. And the bodies are going to just be laying around in the ground for the birds and the wolves and the, car, the foxes to come and, and devour. And he's already spelt that out. And he's going to tell us why he's come, come to this point. But he says here, he says, I don't want you to cut yourself. Now, that's a pagan way of the, the, the way that the pagans used to uh, bemoan themselves. Um, it showed a depth of, of sorrow and a depth of, uh, of, uh, of mourning, cutting themselves. Matter of fact, God told the children of Israel when they came into the land in Deuteronomy chapter 14, Verse 1, he says, when you come, he says, you're a special people, peculiar people, a people that I've chosen. And he says, and I don't want you to act like the people in the world who cut themselves and make themselves bald for their dead. And so he, he, he in, gives them specific details, but they have come to do this now. They were doing this. They were practicing the ways of the pagans of cutting themselves and, and doing these things to themselves. And, 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 you know, in different parts of the world, people do this. I think of, uh, of how in parts of India, when a, a man dies, a husband dies, and he is uh, cremated, they set him on fire and they're burning his body and, and if his wife is there, she's alive or whatever, if she's a good wife, she'll throw herself into the fire as they are, you know, burying or cremating. And, and so they, they had these rituals, and they, we still have them around the world today that bring harm to the bereaved. And so, so God says, I don't want you to do any of this. Neither shall men tear themselves for for them in mourning, to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them a cup of consolation. Basically, a, a, you know, kind of a cup of wine or, or sedative or something like that to, to ease their pain, to calm them down. He says, he says don't, uh, don't do this. To drink for their fathers or for their, their mother. Thou shalt not also go into the house of feasting. Now here we are told not to feast with them. Don't, don't go to the, the feast that's connected to the, fu the funeral or to the, the marriage. He said, don't go into the house of feasting to sit with them or to eat or to drink. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will cause 
to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your days, the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. He says, Jeremiah, in your day, you're going to be alive to see this. In your day, Jeremiah, you're not going to hear any mourning in Israel. And you're not going to hear the tears and you're not going to hear the mourning. You're not going to hear the, the festive celebrations of the, of the marriages, the bridegroom and the bride. If there was two things that the Jews were experts at, they were experts in funerals and weddings. Man, they know how to throw a funeral and they know how to throw a, 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 a wedding. And it was, it, it was an amazing thing, still is today. And uh, I mean, it, it is unbelievable to see uh, the weddings and, the, and the, the funerals there today. And yet God says, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, you're going to see this, but there's not going to be any sounds of joy or mourning in the land. Why? Because there's not going to be anybody left. And in verse, so, so it, it was a very natural thing, but God told his prophet not to do anything. Why? Because these natural things would not be experienced due to Babylon's invasion. When people asked why Jeremiah wasn't getting married, they would probably ask him this. They would probably want to know why he was being rebellious towards his parents or, or what's, what's wrong, you don't want to be married. And he could tell them at that time that God told him not to, not to be married. Well, why? Well, then he could use it as an opportunity to tell them that judgment is coming. And you could see probably the expressions on their face. Man, and this judgment would be so great that it would remove any and all expressions of grief. Well, in verses 10 through 13, we begin to see Jeremiah's explanation. God begins to tell him, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt show this people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Why has the Lord pronounced all these great evils against us? Or why is our iniquity? Or, why, or what is, is our sin that we have committed against the Lord? Why they, when they begin to ask questions, why did God do this? Then sh thou shalt say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord. This was the reason that God told him that he was going to judge the people. Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods. You're into idolatry. And have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my, my law. Basically, God says, you've removed yourself from my protection, and therefore, the only thing that you have left is judgment. You've, when we sin against God, when we turn our hearts away from the Lord, what happens is that we open ourselves up to all kinds of dangers. We open ourselves up to spiritual dangers as well as physical dangers. And we open ourselves up to, to, to basically, and what we've done is we removed ourselves from God's protection. And so God says, because your fathers have sinned, I'm going to judge you. But yet, he says this in verse 12, and you have done worse than your fathers. For behold, you walk every one after the imaginations of, their, of your evil hearts, that they might not hearken unto me. I mean, your fathers went out there on a, on a regular basis worshiping these gods out in the groves and, and in the high places and stuff. But now... What, what's worse is that you are worse than your fathers because now it's always in your heart. It's always in your imagination. You're always thinking about these things. You've come to a point where it's not even a nece necessary thing to go out there and, and see it and experience it and, and do the act. You're always doing it inside your imaginations. And so, he says, therefore, will I cast you out? And this word cast out 
is basically to be thrust out, to thrown out. It's a violent word. It's, it's, it denotes a, 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 literally somebody just grabbing you and just heave-hoeing, hurling you out into, into judgment. And God says in verse 13, I will cast you out of this land into the land that you know not, neither nor your fathers, neither ye or, nor your fathers, and there you shall serve other gods day and night, where I will, will not show you favor. Oh, God basically says, you're not going to escape. I think what when you read these scriptures, I always are reminded where Paul talks about when we, when we give ourselves to certain gods, when we serve, when we lend our members to something, we become the servant of that, that thing. Paul says, know ye not in whom you lend your members to, there ye become the servants of. And they had lent themselves to their false gods. And now they were going to serve their gods day and night, it says. God was going to cast them out of the land of promise, out of the land of Canaan, out of the land of Israel, and they were going to go into a land that they never knew about. Their fathers never knew about. And they were going to serve those gods that they've been worshiping day and night. The pleasure now turns to bondage. And that's what they're experiencing. And that's the way of sin always. You begin by, by enjoying the sin for a while. But pretty soon the sin finally gets a hold of you. And it finally controls you. And it finally controls you to the point of ruining you. You think of the alcoholic. He first thinks, I can take a drink. And I'm in control. But weeks, months, years later, what happens? drink is in control he's controlling the man no longer does the man have control of the of the the alcohol but he's he's being controlled now by the alcohol he has no no recourse same with the drugs or the lust or whatever it finally if it's not repented of if it's not dealt with if it's not cut off from our life Guys, sin will control our lives and we'll become its servant. And so he goes on and he says here in verse 14. Now, verse 14, he says, now you're going to be carried away. Now, this is what blows me away is the, 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 the grace of God. Right in the middle of God's total judgment and and, and, and you, th you read this, you go, good grief, you know. You, you think, man, there's no way I, I, I'd ever want to experience this. And man, God's really being hard on these guys. And then yet, God says something like this in verse 14 and 15. He says, therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, Babylon. And from all the lands where he had driven them, and I will bring them again into this, their land that I gave unto their fathers. And so God says, God says, you know, I, I'm done with you. Jeremiah, don't pray for these people any longer. I'm fed up with them. They're going out. I'm going to thrust them out. I'm going to hurl them out of this land. I'm done with them. But I'm going to bring them back. <laughs> Just the mercy of God. God says, I'm, I'm done with it. I'm, I'm, my tender mercies and my loving kindness is over with. That's it. But I'm going to give them another chance. I'll bring them back. You see the reluctance of God in his judgment? 
We're going to see it again in just a little bit. God hates to judge, but he will. God hates to chasten his children, but he will. There used to be a doctrine that used to float around in the church. It's still out there called the Father Heart. The Father Heart. Or, let me see. The, yeah, the Father Heart of God. The Father Heart of God. It was a doctrine that went around and it just taught love, 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 love. God's just love, man. God's just total and absolutely love. And it's true. He is. But the doctrine went too far to say that God's love was so great that he would never judge. But see, the scriptures plainly and clearly teaches that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, doesn't he? I mean, God never allows us to get away with our sin. He never allows any of his children to be successful in sin. He loves us so much that he'll say, stop it, stop it. Roger, I told you, stop it. And if Roger doesn't, then God will chase him. If Roger doesn't repent and turn, then God will deal. And it's the same way with your life as well as the brother and sister next to you or in front of you or in back of you. God loves us too much to allow us to go so far to get away from him. And so he'll intervene. And yet, God says to these people, I'm going to bring you back into the land. Now, the saying was, oh, God was the one that brought them out of Egypt. Then he threw them out. But the next phrase will be, is that they're brought back. It was like a whole second exodus all over again. God brought them back. And so he, he promises them to, 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 to return back into the land. Has it, or excuse me, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 teaches us, In wrath, God remembers mercy. Remember that. Right when God's dealing chastisement, He's remembering mercy. It's, it's kind of like God just goes, okay, you know, kind of gets wound up and he says, all right, and comes down and just before he hits you, he goes, instead of wham, and through, throughout the eons you go, you know, or whatever. Because he could do that. He could just hit you and, and where, where'd Roger go? I don't know. He, I saw him just a second, but he just flew off the planet, you know. I mean, that could have been the way, but he, no, he didn't do that. He just said, nope. In judgment, Habakkuk says, he remembers mercy. Now, and he says, and in that remembrance of mercy, he says, no, I promised Abraham the land forever. His seed forever, the land, and he'll bring him back. And he brings them back. And he's still doing that today. He's bringing them back from the north, from, from Russia. He's bringing them back from all over the place. Matter of fact, I was just thinking about the Ethiopians, how they brought back back in the uh, mid-1990s, they brought back the Ethiopians. They took all the chairs, the seats out of the 747s that El Al has, and they filled them up with Ethiopians. Top the number, 1,100 Ethiopians in one plane. And they all stood up and they flew in. And they're the only flight that landed with more people than when they took off. Because there was two women that were pregnant and they had babies on, in the flight from Ethiopia. So they landed with two more extra kids. Unbelievable. And God bringing them back, bringing them back, bringing them back. And, 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 and God says, I'll bring you back. And they won't ever say, well, God brought them out of Egypt. No, God brought them back from the north, from their captivity of Babylon. The greatest testimony, listen to me, 
the greatest testimony that you have that the Bible is true is the Jew in Israel. The greatest proof that the Bible is true is the Jew in Israel today. There has never been a people that have been taken out of their land and brought back the same. Not just once. Not twice. But it's happened to them several times. Brought in. Egypt brought back. Babylon brought back. The dispersion in 70 AD, 2,000 years later, they're still Jewish. Now, they took the Moabites and the Hittites and the Canaanites and the Parasites and everything else. Where are they? They just assimilate it with everybody else. But the Jews still remain Jews. And the greatest proof of your Bible is, is them back in their land. And so... So this is Jeremiah's affirmation. It's God saying, even though this is happening, Jeremiah, I'm going to still bring him back into the land. And so, but then he says here, he says, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall, they shall fish them. And afterwards I will send many, uh, many hunters, and they shall hunt for them from every mountain and every hill and out of the out of the." Caves of the rocks. Sounds like us over in Afghanistan right now. And, and it, but basically, that's what the Babylonians would do. They would come in. It's a, a picture of fishing and putting in this big dragnet and dragging them out. And then the hunter coming in and hunting out. It, it, fishing, you've got one place. You know, you've got wherever there's water, there's, there's fish. Now you're hunting, and it's a little bit dip, more difficult. You've got to go find them. You got to go search for them, and the Babylonians would not give up. They were going to make sure that everybody got taken out of the land, and they would spend in send in specialists to make sure that they weren't hiding in the caves or anything else like that. For my eyes are upon all their ways, and they are not hidden from my face. Neither is is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. And first, I will recompense their iniquities and their sins double because. They have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the uh, carcasses of their, of their detestable and abominable things. I, God says there, there's a double judgment upon them because they have just continued on in their, their, their debauchery. And so he says, O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the nations or the the heathens, the Gentiles, basically, shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanities, and the things in which there is no profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself, and they are no gods? Therefore, behold, I will, uh, I will this once cause them to know. I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might. And they shall know that my name is the Lord. Who is he talking about? What is he talking about? He is talking about the Gentile nations. Coming to the point in their lives that they recognize there's no other God but God. There's no other God but the Lord. There's not the false idols. There's not Baal. There's not Ashtoreth. There's not Molech. There's not all the other gods in the world. Dagon and all the gods of the Philistines and the Hittites and all this. He, they're just going to forsake all this. Our fathers have given us lies. They've inherited lies. They've done all this. And they said, now... We've come to know God is really God. And Jeremiah had a picture, in a sense, God gave him a picture of what is happening today in the Gentile world, of us knowing and coming to the point where we realize 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, what blows me away, Paul talks about how the Gentiles who knew not God, they didn't have the law, they didn't have the they didn't have the, the, the Mosaic law. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. They didn't have anything to tell them, you know, that things. And uh, is it warm in here? Yeah? My wife says it's not, but um, I think it is. And uh, since I'm the pastor, you can open up the door, you know. <laughs> I'll be done in just a few minutes here. So, but... But here, we, um, we see that, that, that they didn't have the Mosaic law. They never had that, that, that privilege of knowing the true God. And so Paul said that these Gentiles came to God by faith. By faith. Not by the, the written word. Not by the law of God the Ten Commandments. He says, no, God says, no, I, I'm, I'm going to have you, you know, hear a story, basically, the gospel, the Christmas story, and the, and the Easter story, and, and you're going to hear everything in between that. And, and by faith, you're going to receive it. And by faith, we did. We didn't live under the law or anything else like that, but when we heard the story of grace, we believed. But the Jews... On the other hand, were blinded, weren't they? The Bible said they were blinded in part that we who are the wild branch, wild olive branch, might be grafted in and that they would be blinded for a season. But afterwards, God would restore and open their eyes. And so this is what this is talking about. And so in chapter 17, it says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is engraved upon the tablets of their hearts and upon the horns of, their, of, of your altars. Basically, what God is saying is that there's a deep-rootedness of sin in the life of Judah. It is so ingrained in them, they won't repent, they won't turn. Now, I was thinking about this, I was reading this uh, a little bit earlier, and, and I was reminded of a story <laughs> of... Of a man that, of, of, well, a man, our president, Calvin Coolidge. He came back from church one Sunday. And he come walking in and his wife says, well, what did the preacher preach about today? And he said, sin. He said, well, what did he say about it? That he was against it. Well, that's what Jeremiah is saying now. That's all Calvin Coolidge said about this message. He says, he talked about sin, he was against it. And, and, and Jeremiah is saying the same thing. God's against sin. And Jeremiah says, I'm against sin. And he's, deal, and he's going to deal with this. As a matter of fact, he's going to list about six different sins that the people of God were so ingrained into. Verses 1 through 4. They were just ingrained into idolatry. He says it's a deep-rooted thing. One of their children remember their altars and their idols by the green trees upon the, the high hills. That is, the, the idols is the groves, the places where they would go and worship their false gods. One of their children remember their altars and their, their idols by the green trees upon the high hills. Oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and, and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue for thy, thy heritage that I, I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thy enemy in a land which thou knowest not. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. He says, he says that I am so angry about this. this and, and really, you remember the commandment of the Lord, the Ten Commandments? 
I am the Lord God. Thou shalt not make any graven image before me. I mean, they weren't supposed to make any idols. The other one, the first commandment was, I'm the Lord God, and there is none other besides me. And so they were, they were breaking commandments left and right here. And God says, you, this, this is it. This is it. I, I, you're, I'm, I'm fed up with it. And so in verses 5, he, he starts dealing with their unbelief. And he says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man who trusts in man, and make flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he's going to be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. He says, basically, a man who trusts in the arm of the flesh. Now, you remember what they were doing at this same time? They, were, they had made a league with Egypt. That if the Babylonians came after them, Egypt would come up and help them, fight with them. And so they could maybe, possibly, fight off Nebuchadnezzar and his army. And so, that's exactly what happened, is Nebuchadnezzar was coming down, the message got to the Egyptians, the Egyptians were coming up to fight with the children of Israel, and so Bab what happened was Babylon just diverted their attention from Judah and went around Judah, went down to Egypt and destroyed Egypt, and then after Egypt was destroyed, came up and destroyed Judah. But they were trusting in the arms of the flesh. They were saying, hey, we've got Egypt. Well, what should we worry about? I mean, man, they're a big army. And whenever we put our trust in the flesh, it's just a bad thing to do. Think about it. Think about what, what happened. Well, God says you're going to be like a shrub <laughs> rather than a tree. Later on, he's going to say, now, if you trust me, you're going to be like a tree planted by the waters. Okay? And so what do you want to be, a shrub or a tree? What kind of vegetation do you want to be? Do you want to be a strong tree or do you want to be a shrub, a tumbleweed? by the Dead Sea, salt. You know, what, what do you want to be? And when you trust in the arms of the flesh, now think about it. Think about how we trust in the arms of the flesh. It's convicting when you begin to really think about it. When you start thinking, well, oh, I can do this. And we don't even pray about anything. And you just, I, I can handle it, I can handle it. Excuse me, God, I can handle this one. And God says, God says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't understand what's coming your way in a couple of days or a couple of months from now. You need to be in prayer. You need to be seeking me. I've got a better way of going at this. And you say, oh, God, I, I can handle it. I've been down this way before. Just let me, just, God, I know how to handle this. And so we go about doing it our way. We're trusting in the arms of the flesh. We're trusting in our wisdom and not his. You can sit back and think about this verse and you can realize, boy, I really trust in the arm of the flesh a lot more than I trust in the Lord. But God says here in the next verse, if you'll trust in the Lord, blessed will you be. Now, do you want to be a blessed man or do you want to be a cursed man? Well, me, I want to be a blessed man. And so it says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, and the Lord is. That is, you remember what Solomon said? He says, trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path, right? That is, if I trust in the Lord, I'm not leaning to my own understanding. That means I'm not leaning on the arms of the flesh. 
I'm not allowing the flesh to control my thoughts, my actions, my, my deeds. I'm not allowing the, 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 the world to dictate how I should react to these search, search, sit in, situations. And so if I'm trusting in the Lord, I'm praying, I'm reading, I'm seeking wise counsel, I'm waiting on God. And so he says, bless. Oh, how happy is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. And then he said, because this is what's going to be the byproduct. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the rivers and shall not see when the heat cometh. But her leaves shall be green and shall not be anxious in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. I mean, look at the, the, the abundance. I remember when I was growing up, my grandfather had a ranch in Victorville. And um, he had a, a river that ran through his property, the Mojave River. And it wasn't very deep, but it was con consistently moving through his, his land. And, uh, and I remember the trees that lined that river, how green they were, how big they were. There were a lot of oaks and, and, and trees that were lining this area and, and, the, and the root systems that were down into the riverbeds. And we'd go down there in the heat of the summer, July and August. And in Victorville, if you know anything about that during that, those times of months, it was hot and it is still hot over there. And so we'd go in there and we'd walk through those trees and the leaves were so green. Here it is in the summertime and it just cool. And we'd sit down in that water and just fill up our boots with water and just put our feet down in them. And we'd just soak ourselves down. And then we'd walk back and get, get to work and just cool down. And we'd be soaking wet and by the by another hour or so, we'd be dry again. But, but it, was, it was just so refreshing. And God says that, that, that when you trust in him, not only are you benefited, but others are benefited because they receive the benefits of your fruitfulness. And so when you abide in him, others Receive from your, fr your, fruitful your fruitfulness. I mean, it, it, it's just amazing. I, I, right now, my, my orange tree in my backyard has been abiding all year long. And it's been producing oranges. And now that tree is just almost a solid orange. There's just so many oranges on that tree. And just sitting there, we were just waiting. Me and Diane was just talking about, oh, I can't wait until they, I wonder when they're going to be ripe. And just yesterday morning, one fell off the tree, and I thought, maybe it's time. You know, and so we're gonna, I'm going to check them out, see how good they are, see if they're sweet and they're ripening right now. And you know, that tree hasn't done nothing but abide. But you know what? I'm going to receive its benefits. And just like when you trust in the Lord, others receive benefits as well. So God wants us to do that. Now, I, I got off on this, but they're, they're not believing. And God says, if you'll believe, you'll be blessed. But then in verse 9, he says, but the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked, who can know it? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Ooh. I mean... That is, you know, you, you, you think about that, and it's one verse you think, well, let's go to the next one, Roger. But we've got to talk about it. You know, it, it really is. The Bible says in, in Psalms <clears throat> 139, David says, God, you know me through and through. And that's what, what God says, basically. He says, who can know it? Who can know the heart? We can never know ourselves in totality. When I think I know myself, that I have a pure motive, 
I really have a pure motive. Then I realize, no, nah, it's not that pure. <laughs> you know, and, and you have to honestly say the same thing. You can shake your head that way. Okay? Because all of us are all the same. We, we, we think, I'm just going to do this for Jesus. And we start doing it. And then all of a sudden, what happened to Jesus? Now we're in thinking about us. What am I going to receive out of this? Remember, remember when the disciples, they were following Jesus? And the disciples finally got, they started seeing all these people get this and get that and all these things. And, and they came up to Jesus and Peter said, Master, we've forsaken everything to follow you. What's in it for us? Basically, they were asking, What's, what are we going to get? And that's our motive. That's what our heart's always saying. What's in it for us? You know, if I do this, if I step out and I serve the Lord in this area, what, what, what benefit is it going to get me? And sometimes we've got to be really honest with ourselves. It's, there's a selfish motive. But does that mean that you shouldn't do it? Absolutely not. Because you know why? God knows your thoughts are far off. That's what Psalms 139 says. He knows your thoughts. He knows your ups rising, your downfalls. You, he knows everything about you. Psalms 139 verses 1 through, I think it's about for, verse 4 or 5. And then it says, and God knows your thoughts are far off. I mean, that is God knows your, your thoughts in their origin. Where does your thoughts come from? What makes you think the way you think? What, what causes you to think the thing you just thought? You're thinking, what's he talking about? You know, everybody's thinking, what am I going to think next? You know, and stuff like that. And, 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 and so you start thinking that way. You'll go crazy if you start doing that. Don't do that. But what you need to do is just realize that, that God knows your thoughts are far off. And he still loves us. And he still understands us. And he says, who can know it? Well, the next verse, it says, I, the Lord, searches the heart, tests and the conscience, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Even though I can't know it, God does. And that's why David said, search me, O Lord, and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And show me, or lead me, in that path of rightness. I mean, God, I don't know myself. Show me. And Lord, if there is a wickedness thought in my way, I'm doing this for my glory rather than yours, then Father, then show it to me. Because I really want to do it for your glory. And then go ahead and do it for his glory. And so <clears throat> he says, he says, he says here, they, they were just caught in un, unbelief as a partridge sitteth. And this verse here, they're caught in, uh, in greed here in verse 11. As a partridge sit on an egg and hatches them not. So he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at the end, of, end shall be a fool. This guy that steals in his life, he's greedy, he's got to get, he's got to get and he swindles people out of his money, out of their money and out of their things and then once he gets it all, he dies. And he's just a fool at the end. And doesn't get to spend it, doesn't get to enjoy it. A glorious and high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of the living water. You remember God said that the children of Israel made two mistakes. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, he told them what their mistakes was. One of them they forsook the fountain of living water and they hewed out cisterns that were broken and so 
we men we can go in you might want to cross reference John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 on this uh, on this one verse Heal me, O Lord, and, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, and thou art my praise. Behold, <clears throat> they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hastened from being a shepherd uh, to follow, follow thee. Neither have I desired woeful days. Thou knowest and, and that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me, thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let me not, uh, let me not be dismayed. Bring upon them the days of evil and destroy them with double destruction. Jeremiah prays, he said, God, I'm putting out your word. I'm doing your, your ministry, and they're persecuting me for it. God, would you deal with them? Don't let them take it out. I've just shared your truth. I, I love what I've been hearing with some of the pastors been, been getting talked to on the, on the, on the, on the uh, <clears throat> radios and, and things about Islam or, or about uh, the things of Christ. And they says, you know, uh, you, know you Christians, you, you say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And, and a lot of pastors and ministers and, and evangelists have been sharing, no, we don't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said, and they'll refer back to the Bible, and they just said, look, the Bible says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come unto the Father but by me. That's what the Bible says. And, and, and that's what Jeremiah is saying here. God, I've just been speaking your word, and I'm getting beat up for it. So, Lord, would you do something about it? Would you deal with them? And here he says, just destroy them double foe. <laughs> what love. You know, I, I mean, that's, that's great. But he says, thus saith the Lord <clears throat> unto me, go and stand in the gate of the, of the children of, uh, of the people, by which the kings of Judah come in. And by which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. So he tells, this is a whole other message. The first one we saw was the message of, of, of the, of the uh, uh, single man, basically. The man that wasn't supposed to be married. But now here's a whole other message that starts up. And it's a short one. And it just basically says this. I want you to stand at the king's gate, start at the king's gate, and then I want you to go to every gate around the city walls. And I want you to stand there as the people go in and out, in and out, and deliver this message. And this is the message. And say unto them, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, and, the, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourself, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it, it in to the gates of, of Jerusalem. Now basically what he's saying is, is that you have been breaking my covenant, and what you, if you'll just repent and return back to the covenant that you have made with me, then I'll stay the judgment. Wow. God says, it's, not, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But then here God, again, is reluctant to judge, and he's still giving them an opportunity to get out of the chastisement that's coming their way. God is so reluctant to deal with, harshly with us but he will and he'll continue to give us a break all the way down until the time that it's just like now man has an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ up to the last breath he breathes and the Holy Spirit will deal with him and 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 deal with him until that last breath is taken and that's what he's doing with him now, he's made covenants. God's made covenants in the past time. The first covenant I think of was Noah's covenant. You remember what the covenant was? The promise of that covenant? What was it? The rainbow, wasn't it? As, uh, that he gave us the rainbow and says, as long as, as, as it stands, I'm not going to destroy this world with a flood any longer. Then there was, there was Abraham. 
And the covenant relationship that, that God had with Abraham was seen in the sign of circumcision. And then there was Moses. And here is the sign that he's talking about. And that was the Sabbath. The Mosaic covenant is, the, is seen in the sign of the Sabbath. Six days thou shalt work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. Six days thou shalt work, and on the seventh you shall rest. One day out of seven days you're to give to God. You're to honor Him. Many of us don't even give Him a half a day. But here he says to them, if you'll just return back to me, I will give you peace in the land. And, and he comes, now the Christian covenant today, the Christian covenant is what? Is seen in the sign of what? Communion. In the bread, in the cup. And so, so that's, that's the covenant that we see. Now, now, as we see this, he says, he says, just come back to the co this covenant relationship with me of, 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 of the Sabbath, and I'll, I'll forget everything. Neither carry forth a burden out of, out of your house and on the Sabbath day. Neither do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day and I will, that I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ears, but made their necks stiff that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it came to pass, if they diligently hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, to bring it to, uh, no burdens through the gates of the city on the Sabbath day, but hallowed the Sabbath day to, to do no work on it. Then shall there, they enter the gates of the city of, of the kings and the princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding on, in chariots and horses. And they, then the princes and, and, and the men of Judah, and it goes, just goes on. God says, I'll just bless you. From Dan to Beersheba, basically. And you'll just be blessed. But if you will not, in verse 27, hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, nor uh, not to bear a burden, even entering into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the, in the palace of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Judgment will come. And it did. You can go in Israel today. Matter of fact, when we go, you can go certain places, especially down in Ophel, the old city of David, and there's a layer of ash that you can see when Babylon came in, when Nebuchadnezzar came and he burnt the city to the ground. And then, he, then later on, the, the Romans did the same thing. And uh, last week I made mention on the 10th of Avon. It, it wasn't that the 10th, it was the 9th. I was one day off. It was the 9th. Went back and checked that out, but it was the 9th. It's the same day the Babylonians took uh, them into captivity. It was the same day and the same month that the Romans took the Jews away. And it's several other dates that are very, uh, very familiar to them that happened on that same day. And it's a very unique thing, but, but God says, this is going to happen. And it did. And God says, hey, you can change it. God always gives us a way out. Do you recognize that in your life? That God is so forgiving and he's so merciful. Even when we read scriptures like this that are so uh, almost, ugh, that he just comes up right in the middle of it and says, but I'll give you a way out. It's never too late. It's never too late for God to show his mercy. I mean, Father, we thank you for your word. We ask, God, that you would just remind us of your grace. And thank you, Lord, that we have seen it and experienced your grace. Lord, may we not get so stiff-necked that we run from that relationship that you've provided for us through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God and through the work of Christ on the cross. Lord, bless in Jesus' name. Amen.